of Kirto. Hey, Steve. How are you? Okay. Except I don't have my volume up enough. <clears throat> Let's see, that should be better. Yeah. Oh, Marsha. Hi, how are you, Rabbi? Okay, good morning. Hey, Daniel. Haven't yeah. been here in a while. Daniel, you're on silent mode. Um, I, um, I read- Whatever. I, re I just read your sermon from yesterday. Yes. Yes, very nice, very thoughtful and uh, very interesting. I actually really enjoyed writing. I do not mind accolades on that one. I, I was proud of it, to be honest. <laughs> oh, but you do mind accolades on some of them. Well, some of them. The last two or three I've written, in all honesty, I was just, I was just going through the motions. I could not really get into it. But this one meant a lot to me. So, okay. All Thank right. you very much. I appreciate it. Okay. Thank Morning, you. Ronnie. I'll tell you a very quick story. I'll try to reduce it to six seconds. A, a friend of mine's son had his bar mitzvah parsha on Yitro, and I asked him, what's he going to talk about? He said, uh, of course, the Ten Commandments. I said, no, he had it all wrong. His mom, my friend, she's, she's, a re she's a judge. I said, he should be talking about your career. You know, Yitro pointing it. I mean, our whole court system was based on Yitro, so um, his mom's a judge. Now retired, but... Mm. I lost that one. Okay. Uh -huh. Good morning, Jennifer. Good morning, Rabbi. How are you? Okay. Thank you for putting us all up here. But of course. But of course, right? <laughs> you make it sound like it was just a simple thing. I think it's magic, like in mysticism. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So um, since part of what we're going to be um, dealing with this morning is the nature of covenant, um, I just wanted to um, share with you something that I, I, I actually, I know that some of you have seen it, but this was a note on Facebook from our friend Karen Tamber Rosenau, right? some uh, student of hers um, had a, a little misspelling and said, marriage was created as a convenient relationship between God, man, and woman. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was hilarious. That was one of my favorites. Yeah, isn't that great? Yeah. <laughs> it's convenient. I posted, I wonder if the person who wrote that was which word that they didn't understand what it meant. What, was it the convenient or the covenant? So, well, I, you know, probably just giving them the benefit of the doubt. Probably was just uh, a little trip of the pen. That's what They'll that's what uh, spell automatic check. spell check will do for you. Exactly, they're going to say it's spell check. Could could well be spell check, but still, you know, spell check does provide some entertaining results now and then. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, um, we are going to talk a little bit this morning about the, um, the, this, um, convenient relationship between God and the Jewish people. And, and so my, uh, my, my question for everyone to start out is what does it mean to have a covenant with God. Hey, it's Daniel. It's uh, dis beyond disputes. Yeah. The two-way so, two street. One forty-one over seven. Two-way street, meaning meaning what, Lou? Uh, you give and you get. Uh, you do this, I'll do that. Um, that sort of and, thing. And the the presumption behind that is that if you don't do this, you don't get that. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> yeah. Covenant, okay. but, covenant is another word for a contract. Okay. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, is there, there could be a question about that. 
a covenant is, com is in contrast to a contract. Contract is legal. A covenant is spiritual and it's a lifetime. Contract can be changed, can be revised. A covenant, when God made a covenant with the people of Israel, it's a lifetime. And it both still define relationships, though. Okay, so you, the presumption behind what you're saying is that the covenant is forever. Well, yes. oh, I, I think yes. it is. It's and, and spiritual. Hold, hold on, uh, Lou, and then Sarah. I, I think uh, when we're talking about the covenant between God and Israel, okay, uh, it's forever. But covenant in more general terms is not necessarily forever. Uh, usually, historically, it's not. Um, for one thing, it's not a, a contract can be between two people of equal uh, power. Um, a covenant is generally not. It's, it's a higher power and a lower power uh, or no power. Um, and there were covenants between kings and people at, uh, in, in the ancient Middle East, um, clearly not uh, an equality um, and, not, and not forever. Mm -hmm. Okay, Sarah. Yes. Oh, uh, again, what I, I'm saying that uh, Brit, like it says, Brit Hile Olam. And I still, there is still a difference. Uh, when you have a covenant, then you are supposedly, right? Like the Jewish people have to remind me that we have a covenant. You know, we have a spiritual agreement and responsibility. And, and it's nothing that can be, it's something that is stamped, like a stamped for, as I said before, that it is forever. Because when you say I have a covenant with God and that's why I do one, two, three. Okay, some people might not agree with it, but when you do have that, uh, that, you know, putting, it's not really a contract because I, like, I don't like the word contract because it's more illegal, illegal. You know, a contract, it could be could be interpreted in different ways. Mm -hmm. But once you have a covenant, it's, it's uh, already the word itself implies that you are not going to change whatever you have done, whatever the covenant really calls for you to act behaviorally, morally, and, and uh, eternally. Okay, so to everything that's been said so far, I would like to add a resounding maybe. Okay. Uh, we're going to see a video uh, prepared for this unit uh, by Dr. Benjamin Summer. Uh, it's a little. Rabbi, Rabbi, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but Karen is in the waiting room and can't get in. I've, I've, I've put her in. I'm sorry, excuse me. Go on. Yeah. Um, so uh, the video you're going to see from Dr. Summer is a little bit longer than the videos we've seen before, and it's in two parts. So we're going to watch the first part, we'll come back for comments, and then uh, we'll see the second part. So Jennifer, roll it. I assume that big black bar is not part of this. In this session, you'll be studying a debate within the Bible about the nature of the covenant or breed between the Jewish people and God. You'll confront questions that come up throughout the Bible. For example, does thinking of the relationship between God and the nation Israel as a covenant or contract, which is to say in legal terms, leave room for more emotional models for imagining this relationship? Will this covenant last forever? What are the political implications of the idea of covenant? Different biblical texts we are going to find answer these questions in different ways. As you go through these texts, you'll see some heated discussions among authors of biblical books about what the covenant means in practical and even military terms, 
and about whether the covenant is eternal. But before you enter into these debates, I'd like to lay out some bigger questions about the role of covenant in Judaism, because the reason the ancient debates matter is that they allow us to confront wider issues. Many people define Judaism as a religion of law, but I think that we should define Judaism as a religion of love even more than we define it as a religion of law. Every morning and every evening, we Jews recite the Shema, which begins by telling us to love God. V'yahavta et Adonai Elohecha. Two of the greatest sages of the Mishnah, Hillel and Rabbi Akiva, maintained that the essence of the Torah can be found in the verse from Leviticus that reads, Love your neighbor as yourself. V'yahavta l're'acha kamocha. In other words, both our daily liturgy and our greatest sages emphasize the centrality of love in Judaism. So it's worth asking, what sort of relationship with God does love enable as opposed to law? How does appreciating the role of love in Judaism alter how we understand the practices of Judaism, the rituals, the ethics, the day-to-day -day details of being Jewish and doing Jewish? In short, what is the relationship between love and law in Judaism, and how does that relationship affect our relationships with God? Now, as we discuss the biblical debates about covenant with these big questions in mind, we are going to find a particular term showing up a good deal, especially when we talk about divine love. That term is grace. This word is not always fully understood, so we should talk about it a little bit. Grace refers to a kindness someone performs for someone else who doesn't necessarily deserve it. To be sure, the word grace has other meanings too, but when theologians use the word grace, what they mean, what, what we mean, is an unearned blessing, some favor that is unmerited. In a single word, we could just say that grace is just a gift, a present. The love a parent has for a baby is an act of grace. The baby has not done anything to deserve that love, but it's there anyway. Life itself is the result of grace, in this case, divine grace. God gives us the gift of life, even though before we received it, we couldn't possibly have done anything to deserve it. People often think of the idea of divine grace as being a really key concept in Christianity and as less important in Judaism. But I would argue that grace is just as crucial in Judaism and modern religious Jews would do well to reclaim it. In Western culture, a great many writers and thinkers have tended to assume that the concept of grace doesn't mesh well with the concept of justice. Grace, we're told, lines up with one particular set of values and ideas, mercy, forgiveness, freedom, love. But justice, we're told, lines up with a completely different set of ideas and values, contract, obligation, reward and punishment, law. To some extent, this division between grace and justice, between love and law, makes sense. If you're selling something and I offer you money for it, and then you accept the money, you have a legal obligation to hand over the item. If, on the other hand, you just like me, or love me, or feel connected to me, you can freely turn the item over to me as a gift. It's precisely the fact that you have no obligation to do so that makes your action a gift and not a transaction. So yes, something freely done and something done out of obligation differ. But many Western thinkers have made a mistake in regarding grace and contract, love and law, not merely as different, but as opposed to each other, as natural enemies. That mistake can lead us to overlook a crucial aspect of the Jewish religion, and it needs to be corrected. Okay, um, any comments or questions up to here? Yes, Daniel. Well, that, that, that um, when I hear the word grace included in the Jewish way of thinking of it, that's not what I think. He said that grace meant that the blessing was undeserved. To me, that's almost irrelevant. It's not, grace comes from someone who's not necessarily obligated to give the blessing. He can or can't. But it really has nothing to do with whether you're 
obligated, whether, whether you deserve it or not. And, and maybe I've lived for 66 plus years, not understanding what it meant, because that, that was totally different than what I thought. Well, I, I'm not sure there's such a great distance between, you know, what, what your definition of it is and, and what he describes. Um, and the, it, just the idea that it is um, a gift you know, uh, is, you know, it, I think that also implies that it is not necessarily something that is deserved. Okay. Uh, other questions or comments up to here? Rabbi, I thought about the priestly blessing where uh, be gracious unto, uh, although that's not, that's God to man or not man to man, but I, that came to my mind. Uh-huh, yeah. So that's, that is, you know, part of God's blessing for us, presumably. <laughs> more, more blessing than we deserve. Right. Okay. Um, Jennifer, let's go back. Grace, covenant, obligation, divine law, divine love. We'll be looking in this unit at some fundamental concepts that show up in the Bible. So I'd like to say something about how the authors of the Bible convey their main ideas about their intellectual style. When we study the core concepts of biblical religion, we need to realize a key difference between ancient Near Eastern texts such as the Bible and texts in the Western tradition of thought that goes back to Plato and Aristotle. Western texts often state basic principles and then draw inferences from them deductively. But ancient Near Eastern texts like the Bible tend not to do this. Instead, they communicate key concepts by using terms or images associated with those concepts. Then, they mix the terminology or modify the images to compare the concepts. So as we study the text in this unit, we'll want to watch out for patterns of characters, words, and images that repeatedly connect up with one idea of covenant or another. In the ways our texts go on to allude to those patterns and alter them, they reveal what they're thinking. In short, what I'm saying here is that the biblical authors were concrete where Western philosophers are likely to be abstract. As a result, we students of the Bible need to work inductively to understand what the Bible is trying to teach us about a group of related beliefs, values, and sentiments. One last thing. Jewish culture has long prized discussion, debate, and even argument. The Talmud, famously, consists of a record of disagreements that are hammered out in the rabbi's shaklavataria, their back and forth. And yet, it sometimes comes as a surprise that Israelites in the biblical period could be nearly as devoted to discussing and arguing as their Talmudic successors. In this session, you are going to see that the authors of some parts of the Bible put forward opinions that differ from those expressed by the authors of other parts of the Bible. You'll see that the prophet Jeremiah sometimes argues with another prophet, such as Isaiah, or with authors of the Psalms. The Bible doesn't always speak to us with one voice. Like the Talmud, the Bible is a record of debates, and sometimes what matters in the Bible is the process of discussing an issue rather than coming to a definite conclusion about an issue. Further, like most modern biblical scholars, I don't assume that the whole Torah is by one author. I think that the Chumash, or the Pentateuch, preserves the writings of a variety of ancient sages, priests, Levites, prophets, and scribes. As a religious Jew and a biblical scholar, I believe that we often should look to the Torah not for dogma, not for one simple truth, but rather for guidance about 
What issues should matter to us as Jews? What issues demand our attention and our discussion? Now that I've laid out these big questions and offered some guidance as to how we can discern core concepts through the Bible's particular way of communicating them and arguing about them, I'd like to invite you to enter some text study together. Let's see how our ancestors and forebears in ancient Israel debated the nature of God's covenant. What is primary, God's law or God's love? Okay, so uh, to, to frame this in a slightly different way from what Dr. Summer just presented, uh, we have the model that Lou Dorfman suggested, which is that the covenant is a quid pro quo, right? I do this, I get that, right? If I don't do this, I don't get that, right? That is what we would call a covenant of law, okay? And that bumps up against this other kind of model, which is a covenant of love, which is leolam, forever, uh, irrespective of, you know, you know one party, may, may not live up to the terms of the covenant, doesn't change the fact that the covenant remains in force, okay? The two separate models. And, you know, we see both of them in our tradition, and we're gonna look at the texts that present both of them, uh, just as Dr. Summer suggested. So um, as you go through these texts, uh, look for certain key terms that might suggest to you uh, which model uh, that text reflects. Okay, uh, questions or comments before we go into the texts? All right then. So, here we begin with a text about the, you know, Brit Nila, the covenant of circumcision, right? Avram is 99 years old. God says to him, and I'm going to skip through parts of this, uh, I will establish my covenant between me and you, and I will make you exceedingly numerous. Um, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the father of multitude of nations. Um, and you are now Avraham. And I will make you exceedingly fertile and make nations of you. And kings shall come forth from you. I will maintain my covenant between me and you and your offspring to come as an everlasting covenant throughout the ages to be God to you and to your offspring to come. Uh, I assign the land to you and your offspring to come as an everlasting holding. Moving along here, right? You and your offspring to come throughout the ages shall keep my covenant. Such shall be the covenant. Every male among you shall be circumcised, right? The age of eight days, right? Uh, thus shall my covenant be marked in your flesh as an everlasting pact. Okay? Any male who is uncircumcised, that person has broken my covenant. Okay? Um, then a little bit about Sarai now becoming Sarah. Okay? Uh, and I will give you a son by her, etc. And I will maintain my covenant with your son Isaac as an everlasting covenant for his offspring to come, etc. But my covenant, uh, you know, I will bless Ishmael, but my covenant I will maintain with Isaac. Okay. Uh, which model of the covenant is this? Yes, Ronnie. Uh, unmute yourself, Ronnie. The way I, I read the passage, 
it has to be a covenant of, of love because nothing was expected in return. Okay. Um, anyone have a different view of that? Yes, Steve. I don't really have a different view. I, I actually, I agree because it's, it's pretty unilateral mm -hmm. except for circumcision. That's the only thing. And he keeps saying, referring to my, you know, to, you know, to, to my thing, not our, our covenant. The covenant requires two parties to reach an agreement. And here, the only thing we're doing, we're just kind of like signing off with the circumcision here, but we're not expecting and we're not, we didn't even agree to it really, except for the circumcision mm -hmm. so far. Yeah, yeah, Lou. I don't know that uh, it requires agreement, Steve. Um, uh, I agree with Ronnie that uh, I think it's a this expression, the text is a covenant of love. And I agree with you that the only thing that's expected back is circumcision. Um, but uh, it, it doesn't have to be an agreement. God is saying, this is what's going to happen. Anyone else? But we know this is not the end of the story either. This is just part one. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. But, but we're just, you know, we're looking at this particular text. Yes, David. Um, I was kind of wondering about the, the fact that women don't seem to have any role in this covenant. I mean, you know, the men are going to circumcise themselves. To, are the women even included? Not in polite society. Um, sure doesn't look like it. I would also argue from that point that the individual demonstrating their covenantal relationship uh, it doesn't get a lot of say in it at eight days old. It's it's so well, that that you know there is that that aspect as well. It's a parent showing a sign of covenant, but it doesn't really. To Lou's point, it's imposed. It's not an agreement. It's an imposition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Daniel. Uh, not to divert, but uh, in the in the parsha that we just read this week, last week. Um, it's Moses does not bring his son Gershon into the covenant with circumcision. His wife does, and a parent, and she wasn't even Jewish. So somehow or another, women had a role. We just see little bitty glimpses of it, and, and I think that's a big problem. Yeah, but at least in theory, I think David is right in that women, <laughs> generally speaking, do not have an independent authority within this covenant. They're included in the covenant, but only by virtue of their uh, link to their husbands and fathers. And David is correct. Yeah. Um, I had a question about yes, Marcia. the mention of Ishmael, and you kind of glossed over that, but uh, that he was not circumcised, and it was just uh, Isaac, who was. So could you uh, tell me a little bit more about that component? Because I know he became the forebearer, the forebearer of the Muslim faith. But uh, so could you explain that? Why well, he was not circumcised? Let's, let's leave out the part about the Muslim faith, because, you know, the Bible doesn't know anything about that. Well, right. Yeah. So that's in the future. You know, that would that would be a job for medieval uh, theologians to tackle. Right. Um, you know, with, with the Bible, it, it's much easier. In other words, God says, I'm going to give Ishmael all kinds of things. All right. I'll make sure that he's provided for, but mm -hmm. he's not part of this deal. Right. And, and that's, I, I think, pretty clear. Yeah, Ronnie. Oh, uh, Lou? Well, Ishmael was circumcised. He wasn't circumcised at eight days old. He was circumcised, I think, at 13 years. Yes. yes. And that's the Muslim tradition, I think, is 13 years. Based on that, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. However, you know, that's, in, in that case, the circumcision is not really described as part of the covenant. 
So again, we're back, we're back to the question. And, and so far, I think, you know, everybody seems to be saying that this text represents a covenant of love, an eternal, co unconditional covenant. Except for the problem that there is that one little thing that is expected. And if you don't do that, you're cut out of the deal or your generations will be cut out of the deal. So I think it's reasonable to say that this text has elements of both models, that there is at least this one expectation in law, mm -hmm. as well as the uh, understanding of the covenant as freely given and an act of love. Mm -hmm. Right? So a little bit of this and, and a lot of that. Okay, let's go on to text number two from Second Samuel. All right. So King David here right, is talking to Samuel, or is, is talking to um, the prophet Nathan. All right. And the king says, you know, I'm living here in a nice house, and the ark of God is sitting in a tent. How appropriate is that? And Nathan says, well, okay, right? That's, that's reasonable. You know, God is going gonna, is gonna to work with you to fix that. And then that night, the word of the Lord comes to Nathan and says, tell him, I don't know if you're the one to build a house for me to dwell in. You know, from, from the very beginning, from the Exodus. I have not dwelt in a house. I have moved about in tent and tabernacle. I went wherever you all went. And I never reproached any of the Israelites and said, well, you know, how come you haven't built me a nice house? And this further tell David, you know, you know, I took you to be the ruler of Israel. I've been with you wherever you went, cut down all your enemies. I will give you great renown. I will establish a home for my people Israel and plant them firm so they shall dwell secure and not be oppressed. I will give you safety from all my, all your enemies. God declares to you that he will establish a house for you. Right? And then Afterwards, I will raise up your offspring and establish his kingship, and he shall build a house for my name, and I will establish his royal throne forever. Right? When he does wrong, I will chastise him, but I will never withdraw my favor from him, as I withdrew it from Saul, whom I removed to make room for you. Your house and your kingship shall ever be secure before you. Your throne shall be established forever. Mm. Okay? So, which model of covenant is this? Yes, uh, Carolyn. Well, it certainly seems somewhat conditional. I mean, you know, I, I withdrew it from him, but really this is, this is for you for good forever. Uh, why? No reciprocity there. Covenant of love, right? Yeah, it's a covenant of love, but it's also somewhat movable, uh, even much to the protestation of the, you know, forever part of it. Uh huh. So again, largely a model of love, but with a little bit of a twist of law too. Right? Yeah, Lou? Yeah, I was just going to say it has elements of both. Okay. Anyone else uh, have a comment? Yeah, I just think we, we live in this time where we're 
like we just read Parsha Yitro and everything we see, it really is a quid pro quo. It's hard not to be influenced by seeing it's, it really is a contract. God said, you do this, I'll do this, you know? And I'm contrasting this, but this is a much lighter touch where we are right now. Yeah, um, and, and I like that, Steve, you mentioned the word if, right? That's one of the key terms in a covenant that is based on certain conditions, right? In other words, a covenant of law. If this, then that. Um, unlike a covenant of love, which wouldn't necessarily use the word if. Okay. And some parents love their children, but they, that's why they put conditions on it. They want to try to help them. Right. If you don't straighten up. <laughs> it's, it's not because they really necessarily need them to straighten up. It's because they're doing it for their own best interest. Yeah. Out of love you sometimes do these things uh-huh but i mean the love might be unconditional but the if still remains right yeah. you don't straighten up uh yellow uh this relates to the uh, mysticism class and the sefirot and having gavura and chesed mm -hmm. keeping those things in balance keeping uh love and rules in balance, okay, and that's, but that's more about parents and children than it is, or maybe not, than, but I think more about parents and children than God and the Israelites. Yes, Ronnie. Okay, there were parts of this that really bothered me, and I think the main thing that I kept hearing is God has made these promises to King David and to future generations. And if you look at the words of what he promises, obviously it hasn't been fulfilled because there is so much strife and, and terror in Israel. Uh, our safety has not been provided for us. So whatever he was promising did not happen. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah, but we're still here. I mean, everybody else is gone. No chance. He specifically says, I'm going to protect you from your enemies and you're going to have peace. And, you know, um, and that's not the way it's been. Thousands and thousands of years, there's been nothing but what, what with war and, and there hasn't been peace. So it doesn't sound like that God has made good on his promise, covenant, whatever you want to call it, to King David. Yeah. So I think that that would be evidence for looking at the covenant as conditional, which many Jews did, right? They, they looked at the circumstances. Let's, let's just go back to the first exile, right? Um, and some of the people had believed before that, that, you know, God had promised that they would be protected. Right? And then it didn't happen. And they said, well, maybe we messed up. Maybe we did something wrong. And we failed to follow through on our end of the covenant. And that's why God didn't fulfill his end. Right? So that's kind of a, you know, a time-honored tactic among Jews um, to say, well, you know, why did this bad thing happen to us is because, you know, we did something wrong rather than looking at circumstances and just saying, you know, bad things happen. I need, I need to leave for 10 minutes. I got to go check my business. I'll be right back. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes. Yeah, Daniel. Um. Maybe the whole idea of looking at this as a binary choice, either or, that it's either justice or law, is is not the way we should be looking at it. May all maybe all covenants, all contracts, involve some of each. We we have justice because we love. 
Well, I would say that that there are some texts, that, you know, we're going to look at which really fall pretty clearly into one model. Good. Let's. I, I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, Jerry. Jerry, unmute yourself. In there, they talk about uh, God tells uh, David, I don't know if you're the right guy to do this for me. So, right. Later, and and, and so later on, so later no, on, there's this piece in the tradition about, you know, David having been a, uh, a man of war, and yeah, the God, temple is supposed to be a place of peace. Right, but, but that was his job, you yeah. know? Yes. He, yes. So David had his job and Solomon gets the other job. Okay. But it doesn't mention it in that in that little piece that you I mean, you know, we're stretching things here. You know. Dave was asking why why don't you let me build it? And you know, he's he's saying, Well, you can't do it because you know you are a womanizer, you like to fight, you like blood, you know, all that. But but that was the reason he was the king, right? Correct. Not to be a womanizer. No, I know, but he <laughs> but he did some things that he wasn't supposed to. Let, let let me put it more simply. I think you know David was the king that was needed for his time. Right. 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 And at least in Jewish thought, let's let's leave aside the person David. In Jewish thought, David is the sinner, but he is also this spiritual person who always returns to God in spite of his own shortcomings. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Other comments or questions before we go forward? Yeah, Lou. Uh, in, in that uh, God has perhaps not protected us from all of our enemies. Um, I don't know if we want to get into this discussion, but you know, is God omnipotent or not? Does God intervene in human action? Um, or did he just set it on course and what's going to happen is going to happen? Um, so my answer to that, Lou, is yes. <laughs> um, uh, and and maybe the answer is also sometimes yes and sometimes no. And I was going to add to that that I, maybe God sometimes just doesn't live up to his end of the, you know, maybe he doesn't follow through on what he said. Is that a possibility? Sure it is. Right. Um, which, you know, doesn't make God look very fair. But then again, the world is unfair. So welcome to uh, god's world according to the bible god has uh, more than once changed his mind right and so have the jewish people i think that's been a continuum <laughs> that reminds me of, of never mind forget i said it. of course god would i guess the argument there is God changes his mind because the people, because of the people's actions, but maybe, you know, I'm, I'm, is it possible that God just changes his mind versus, you know, he had a bad day and he doesn't, he's just irritating. I don't know. Did God have a bad century or, or something? You know? Yeah. Um, so again, those are not questions that we can you know, at least adequately answer. Um, we all kind of wrestle with with those questions individually and as a group. Um, so but you said that, he, but, but you said that Jews tend to look at it as well. If something bad happens, we must have done something wrong. Jews, you know, that that is one one approach. Yes, right. No, and I think I agree with you that I think we often go there as opposed to thinking, well, maybe God's just not filling his end of the bargain here, but that's harder to think about. It is, although I think that many Jews over the centuries 
uh, took that approach, but taking that approach ultimately tends to read you out of the people, right? In other words, if you're going to assume that God is radically unfair and does not follow through on his end of the covenant, uh, then your next step is likely to be to reject any part in the covenant. Yes, because, right. because a covenant is not only a covenant for good times. When you have a covenant, it's also for difficult times. And as you're saying, we, we, when we want to accept only the good part and not the bad part, then we are out of the covenant. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so I want to move forward to the next text here. Um, and as we, um, as we look at this, this is from yesterday's Torah reading, right? Um, you know, look at this and, and see what indicates which model of covenant we're talking about. Right? So the Israelites enter the wilderness of Sinai. They encamp in front of the mountain. Moses goes up to God. God says to him, right? you have seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to me. Now then, if you will obey me faithfully and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all the peoples. Indeed, all the earth is mine, but you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And everyone says, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. Okay. Which model of covenant is this? I think it's a model of law because he's saying you have to do what I've asked you to do to for me to protect you so i think it's a model of of law that he sets a condition upon which uh the jewish people will be protected yes yeah and, and the key word there is the word if if yeah if you do this then i do that if you don't well then the covenant doesn't protect you anymore yes ronnie so it's my understanding that at the this particular parsha, that the Jewish people did not yet know what was expected of them. They just agreed. Is that correct? They had looks, not received the it law. It looks like it. Right. right. They they give a general sort of agreement. Mm -hmm. Let's say you know yes you know whatever God has given us whatever God will give us. We're in. They were, you know, very, and, very and, you know we, we talked about this in our study group Thursday night. Uh, for those of you who were part of that, the, um, you know, the, the whole notion of, um, you know, how does God get this kind of agreement from people? And the answer is, well, God does certain things, you know. God, you know, it's, it's like the Ten Commandments are not given at the beginning of creation, right? The Ten Commandments are given after God has taken everybody out of Egypt, given them food, given them water, um, fought for them in the war with Amalek, right? And now God says, okay, I'll be your king, right? And the Israelites, instead of saying, what have you done for me lately? They say, all right, we're in. You've, you've done this. You've done all this for us. So we're in. Okay. So when God says, if, God has credibility because God has already done a lot of stuff for them. And so they're the people are more prepared to enter into that kind of open-ended covenant without knowing what else God has in, in mind. You know, um, sort of reminds me of, you know, the, um, 
remember Woody Allen's movie Bananas, uh, where you know the government, uh, one of the decrees of the new government is that everyone will wear their underwear on the outside, right? <laughs> okay, and nobody knows what the government is going to come up with, right? But you know they they went in because the government you know sort of came in, overthrew the old bad government. Uh, and here, God's done all sorts of things. They don't know what kind of craziness God is going to ask of them next. I ask them, you know, to keep kosher. <laughs> you know, wow. What's well, God going to think of next? He's a good negotiator. I mean, if you set the people up and do all these good things and, you know, then they're going to agree to it. Yes. <laughs> Once you've done all this stuff for the people, uh, you can you can come up with all kinds of things, and people will say, "All right, we're in. You know, we'll do it." You know. Fortunately, God did not ask us to wear our underwear on the outside. Um, you know. I haven't seen proving, that movie in fifty years, and now I'm going to have to go back and watch it again. <laughs> proving that there is a hell of a big difference between God and Woody Allen. Although um, there are people that wear their underwear <laughs> sort of on the outside. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> All right. Um, moving right along here. Um, let's go to text number four from oh, whoops, Deuteronomy chapter 11. All right. So, you know, this section includes the second paragraph of the Shema, when it begins, Vahaya im Shamoa, right? Um, so, you'll, you decide as we read this, which model of the covenant this reflects, right? So he says, love the Lord your God, always keep his charge and his laws and his mitzvot, the yada yada. If you obey the commandments that I enjoin upon you this day, loving the Lord your God and serving him with all your heart and soul, I will grant the rain for your land in season, the early and the late. You'll gather in all the food, right? all the grass for your cattle, and you will eat your fill. Do not be lured away to serve other gods and bow to them because God is going to be mad. And then there will be bad results. Right? So impress these words upon your very heart, etc. Teach them to your children, put them on the doorposts of your house and your gates, so that you will endure in the land that God swore to your fathers to assign you. Right? And if you faithfully keep all this Torah that I command you, loving the Lord your God, walking in all his ways and holding fast to him, the Lord will dislodge before you all these nations, and you will dispossess nations greater and more numerous than you. Okay, so which model of covenant does this text reflect? Yes, Ronnie. Um, I'm going to repeat what Marcia says. At the beginning of the second paragraph is the word if. So right. that. I agree, Ronnie. <laughs> Thank yeah. you, Mark. <laughs> okay, so that's that's the cue that we're looking at a conditional covenant, a covenant of law. Mm -hmm. Okay, you keep the terms, and then I will keep the terms. Yes, are, there, are there are there covenants of law that do not contain the word "if"? Or is it always there. Um. Well, you could look at the, um, or, you know, the first text that we looked at about circumcision uh -huh. as perhaps, you know, indicating at least to some degree that, you know, we're looking at a covenant of law because it does talk about a condition, even though it doesn't directly use the word if, okay. if you circumcise all your all your little boys, then the covenant will remain in force. And if you don't, then it won't. Yes, Lou. 
It actually does use the word if, at least in the translation where it says, and if any male who is uncircumcised fails to uh, circumcise the flesh of his foreskin, dot, dot, dot. Okay. Okay, yes, Steve. I have to go back to this last week's parsha again with the whole idea about accepting the covenant with the Mount Sinai being held over the Jew people's heads. And it's saying the top teeth, the, the story. And I don't think we can't take it with the legal, with the, you know, we, I think we need to out. And that's like our out with the, um, we're in the court of law. And what do you plead? And they say, what do you plead? You say, it's duress. You know, I was compelled to, I didn't voluntarily do this. I was, and that's where we get to God's grace. If we want to go back to the beginning to God's mercy to let us out and rehabilitate us back in because so we, I mean this it's, it's the element of both of those in there but there's um, clearly a contractual basis you do this but we never quite get to the ending God never ex it takes advantage of his his um, prerogative to end the contract you know, the covenant right so that midrash that you begin with uh, is definitely reflective of a, a conditional covenant right? You know, God holds the mountain over the people and says, do you agree? <laughs> and, and if you don't, I'm going to turn this mountain on top of you. I said, we agree. We agree. <laughs> some, you know, some condition. Okay. Um, interestingly, you know, Rabbi Yitz Greenberg has written about the notion of how, at least in our time, the covenant is a voluntary covenant, right? Because God is no longer holding the mountain over our head. It's not like we don't understand the covenant uh, in that way. It's a, you know, from our end, it's voluntary. We, you know, hopefully, we accept the terms of the covenant, even though we know that, you know, we have a choice. It's an open society. We can walk away from it if we choose. Yes, Lou. I don't know that I agree with that completely, Rabbi. Um, certainly there's no physical mountain over our head, but there are challenges that we face as a people uh, that, interpretively could be looked at as uh, God holding something over our head, uh, anti-Semitism and it is the one that I think of the most. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I, I think you're right, but I also think that, you know, individuals uh, will say, well, that's not my problem. I choose to walk away. And in an open society, they have the potential to do that. And you and I might think that that's reprehensible, but they have that choice. The ancient Israelites did that too. Um, you know, it's, it, even in the wilderness, and when they got into the land of Canaan, um, there was continued uh, turning their backs on God. Mm -hmm. So what bothers me very much in the modern world and maybe it's post-Christianity, is how it seems to me that the Jews did not walk away from God, and yet all this anti-Semitism, the Inquisition in 1492 with the Spanish, the you know, genocide of Adolf Hitler, all of these things, did we walk away from God? Did he protect us? That, it seems like, it's a one-way street. God says he'd protect us, but we weren't protected. Yeah. We're still here, though. We're still yeah. here. That's yeah. true. You know, so some people would interpret the covenant to mean not that bad things won't happen to individual Jews, but that the Jewish people will survive. And I think that that's also part of what Yitz Greenberg says in talking about the the term of a voluntary covenant a vol voluntary covenant uh okay uh it is 10 59 
I'm going to take a short break before uh, our uh, 11 o'clock class. Thank you all very much. We'll continue on this next week. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Excellent okay. class. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Jennifer. Thanks. All right. All right. All right. Okay.